Esteemed colleagues, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to welcome you all here today, but of course a special welcome to my colleagues from the three Baltic parliaments, Lithuania, Latvia and Estonia. I'm very pleased that you are all here, very pleased and honoured. Most of us here today have very clear and vivid memories of what happened in the Baltic state 30 years ago, which also, I believe, says something about how old we have all become. Uh, the fact is that you must be at least in your 40s today to have any personal memories of the dramatic events on the other side of the Baltic Sea. This means that the younger generation can hardly recall these events, which is one good reason for holding this seminar, to educate our citizens and make them remember. Uh, without the historical context, it's hard to understand the political position in which Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia find themselves today. Another good reason, reason for holding this seminar is that relations between our countries have been excellent during these last 30 years, and that this seminar can also be seen as a way of confirming that relationship. The historical ties between our countries, of course, go back considerably longer than 30 years. Just before the pandemic broke out in early 2020, I had the pleasure of completing my tour of the three Baltic states with an official visit to Estonia. It was indeed rewarding to visit our dear neighbours uh, and learn more about your fascinating history and your struggle for freedom. Your countries have lived through, through both war and occupation. Your course of, course of history changed dramatically from the adoption of independence and democracy more than 100 years ago to occupation and back to independence once more three decades ago. Indeed, the fact that I can receive the speakers from the parliament of the three free and independent Baltic states is in itself a remarkable thing from a historical point of view. For hundreds of years, your countries were occupied or dominated by other powers until the independence in 1918 gave you liberty for a brief moment. Then you had to wait another four decades to renew your independence, which I'm sure will now last forever. As I'm sure you will hear from the podium today, your struggle was also our struggle. Awareness grew in Sweden to a large part thanks to what was known as the Monday Movement. Week after week, people gathered at Norman's Torg in central Stockholm, and week after week, the, numbers, uh, the number of people grew, grew and grew, and so did the number of towns and cities all across Sweden where Monday meetings were organised. Uh, this also meant that international pressure on the leaders of the Soviet Union grew day by day. The movement in Sweden no doubt helped build up national and international support for your cause. On the other hand, the real heroes were of course you yourselves. You were the ones who risked everything. You willingly put yourselves in harm's way, you took the risks. Not all of you survived. For this reason, it is my honour to bid an extra warm welcome to the freedom fighters, Ms. Velta eh, Cebotarinoka of Latvia, Mr. Alexandras Abisala from Lithuania, and Mr. N. Esma from Estonia. Your contributions... Your contributions to the freedom movement cannot be overstated, and I am very much looking forward to listening to, you, to what you have to say. It was because of your personal courage and the courage of many of your compatriots that your countries are free today. For this, we salute you. Sweden has long been a staunch supporter of freedom and democracy in the Baltic region. For instance, we were the first country to open a representation in Riga back in 1990. Uh, the same year, my predecessor invited his fellow speakers with delegations from the newly elected parliaments in the Baltic countries to visit the Riksdag. Since then, many things have happened. You are now all well integrated and respected members of the European and Nordic communities. Our countries may have arrived at the present day in different ways, but one important thing still stands. We are neighbours, we are friends, and we share the same values. Again, a warm welcome to the former First Chamber of the Riksdag. 
We have had the pleasure of seeing many of you here before, and I'm convinced that we will see you here many more times in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, uh, all my good friends uh, from the Baltic States and friends and foes from the Swedish Parliament on that side, uh, welcome to this seminar. It's more like a, a, a family gathering because we have our relatives from Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania here with us in our parliament and really uh, manifesting this Nordic-Baltic relations that we have between our countries. So I'm pleased to uh, chairing uh, this seminar. I have divided it in two parts, uh, more like past and presence. Uh, so we start First, with the heroes from the, uh, from the Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the freedom fighters. Uh, and then we're going slowly over to present time. Uh, my name is uh, Hans Wallmark. I'm the deputy chair on the Committee on Foreign Affairs, and I'm also co-chairing the Baltic network that we have here in the Swedish Parliament. So uh, I'm quite familiar with your three ambassadors here also in the room. Um, and uh, I give uh, approximately five minutes to all for a, a starting round. And we have the first panel in 40 minutes, and then we're going to change to another uh, panel. And we start with um, Velta Shebutarnenkwa. Well, it's, it's, uh, I'm so sorry <laughs> that I'm destroying your name. Uh, Miss Velta is going also to have her uh, speech translated uh, by Vita Viktorsson, Viktor Sone. Uh, Velta is born in 1949 in Riga. She has studied in Latvia State University. She started her career as a secretary at the Latvian Amateur Film Studio. After graduating, she worked as a desk officer at the Culture Commission of the Science Society. In 1985, she started working for the newspaper Jurmala. Uh, at the founding congress of the Latvian Popular Front in 88, she was elected member of the Council of the Popular Front. In 89, she was elected member of the People's Deputies at the Jurmala City Council. Later, she was their deputy chair. In 1990, she candidated for the elections of the Supreme Council of the Latvian from the list of the Popular Front, served in the Commission of, on Human Rights and National Affairs. After the end of her term of the Deputy of the Supreme Council, she worked in the field of public relations. Please. Thanks. So, in the very beginning, a personal comment from me. My family name is very difficult to pronounce. Cebotarenok, because of my husband, Igor. Cebo Tarenok, because he was born in Krasnoyarsk, but he was Latvian, uh, and he was in exile. That's why I have such family name. Honorable Speaker of the Riksdag, Honorable Speakers of the Parliaments of the Baltic States, Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, I love Latvia deeply. I was raised to love it. In 1990, I voted in favor of the Declaration of Independence of the Republic of Latvia, and in August 1991, I voted for the statehood of Latvia. This year, we celebrate the 30th anniversary of the restoration of de facto independence of our state. But why exactly did I choose to take this difficult path and become one of the 138 restorers of our independence? Knowing fully that Latvia was occupied by Soviet Union and we were living under severe totalitarian conditions. Furthermore, the Soviet armed forces were deployed in every corner of Latvia. And uh, the general headquarters of the Baltic military district were located in Riga. My childhood and youth were spent in the occupied Latvia. Naturally, as a child, I enjoyed the sun, the sea, the snow, 
and was not aware of many important facts. That was until my father, a member of parliament during the first period of independence, showed me photos of him at the Saima building, standing next to the flag and the coats of arms of the Republic of Latvia, and made me promise to keep this information a secret. During my earlier years at school, you could not even buy white bread anywhere in Latvia, since all the wheat grain supplies were sent to the vast Russia. Today, my granddaughter cannot comprehend that at that time, the stores were empty and people were given food ration stamps, which we could use for our monthly purchase of one kilo of flour, sugar, washing powder, shampoo and other goods. Meat, sausage and butter could be acquired through the so-called blood. That meant being acquainted with a salesperson. It was an entire system that suppressed the Soviet people. The people were dependent on this system. One relative of mine waited 20 years in a queue to buy a car. Another waited eight years for the fixed telephone to be installed in their home, while another waited 40 years to get an apartment. People waited for several years for their turn in the queue at their workplace to buy washing powder, TV or fridge. The manufacturing industry of the vast Soviet Union only served the needs of Soviet army. The Soviet Union focused on a constant arms race, but all this is nothing compared to the everyday manifestations of the Soviet totalitarian regime. I will share a memory from my first place of work. Young and cheerful, I gave a speech in Latvian at a work meeting. The next day, I was called by the deputy director, who turned out to be the undercover official of the KGB. Of course, I was unaware of that. He scolded me for speaking in Latvian and threatened to reprimand me if it were to happen again. All of my colleagues were Latvian apart from the head accountant who was Russian and who, despite having lived in Latvia for 30 years, did not understand the Latvian language. All of our work documents had to be written in Russian. It was painful and humiliating. There was a person in every single workplace and even every group of friends who participated in conversation with great enthusiasm only to report them to KGB. Thus, our small country had a great number of political prisoners, victims of political repressions and those who were not allowed to go abroad, like me. This feeling of doom and oppression had accumulated, and thus various organizations such as the Helsinki 86 group and the Latvian National Independence Movement and the Popular Front were established to start a peaceful but a determined fight for the independence of Latvia. Similar movements were started in all three Baltic states at the same time, unifying a large group of people and manifesting that the burden of the Soviet occupation had become too heavy and that nobody was willing to continue living in this prison-like environment. The nations were ready to fight for freedom and independence. Back then, our whole lives served the greater cause, the independence of Latvia. The road towards this great achievement was long and difficult, and all the other aspects of our lives were secondary. On May 4, 1991, we declared our desire for an independent state. Our vote 
demonstrated the confidence in our dream, and it was the beginning of a fierce and difficult battle for complete independence of the state of Latvia. The Soviet armed forces continue to demonstrate their power over Riga and the entire Latvia. It's no coincidence that barricades were built in January 1991 and the people defended their parliament against the militarized formations of the foreign power. People died on the streets of Riga. On uh, August 21st, 1991, while MPs voted for the statehood of Latvia, Soviet armed vehicles were making their way towards the parliament. Soviet troops were ready to destroy the barricades and break into the parliament building to arrest all of us. However, following our vote, everything felt silent. They had lost. I still remember how we waited for global recognition and acceptance of our state. I wish to thank the governments of Estonia and Lithuania, and of course Iceland, the first country to recognize the declarations of independence of all three Baltic states. I would also like to extend my gratitude to Sweden for understanding our situation and supporting us. I thank Lars Fredén, the former Swedish consul in Riga, for his visit during the unstable period when we had not yet achieved independence. His visit was of immeasurable importance. I thank God that we have such friends, partners and supporters who are just a stone's throw away. We rely on you. I would like to express particular gratitude for their support to Karl Bildt, Thomas Bertelmann and Pierre Schori. Thank you. The dreams in Latvia, we now turn over to the dreams in Lithuania. Alexandras Abishala, he's 65 years old, he's a managing partner of UABA, Abishala and Partners since 93. He studied in Vilnius University. For 10 years, he was a fellow researcher in semiconductor physics. Uh, in 88, he joined the Lithuanian independence movement, Sayudis, was elected to National Council of Sayudis. Abisala was elected to the parliament in 1990 and became signatory of the Independence Act of the Republic of Lithuania. Member of the cabinet of the government in 91 to 92, prime minister of the Republic of Lithuania from July to December 92. After quitting political career, he started independent management consultancy. Please, Mr. Abisala, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you indeed. Uh, as a consultant on strategic management, I would like rather to speak on future. But as political dinosaur, of course, I understand that I have to speak of the past. Uh, during our independence fights, if you ask people why, why do you want independence? Many of them would say because we want to live as in Sweden. They meant mainly, of course, uh, economic wealth. Uh, the first capitalist country I happened to visit uh, as a member of Parliament of Lithuania uh, was, guess what, Sweden. Under invitation of Rix Dak in 1990, summer 1990, far before uh, formal recognition of our relations, and it was a brave step. And, uh, even though uh, Soviet ambassador participated in all the meetings, and then uh, I get to Sweden in 91, then uh, in 92 uh, to bring a team of Lithuanian orienteers to five-day uh, orienteering festival here in Sweden, but he had to come back the same day with the same plane, leaving them there because next day he had to participate in the voting in the parliament to appoint myself prime minister. Uh, 
as, as, as such, I, uh, I did participate in, in first meetings of uh, the format uh, Nordic plus Baltics of prime ministers, and finally, uh, I had the honor to receive uh, their majesties, king and queen of Sweden in Vilnius. So you see, my personal relation with Sweden is very deep. Uh, therefore, uh, I cannot speak uh, independently about relations of Lithuania and, 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 and Sweden because I have some personal conflict of interest to speak too good about those relations. Um, the, I had first three impressions in my first uh, visit to Sweden that hit me most. Uh, one was people were fishing down there for salmon in the middle of Stockholm. Uh, in Lithuania, rivers were so polluted that not only salmon but other fish was not, not so in place. Uh, another was uh, when we went around to the, uh, to the, to the province, we saw uh, national flags uh, hanging in every household in the front yard and, and, and so on. In Lithuania, we left our national flag. We, we, uh, we honored that as a symbol of fight. And it looked to us that uh, you can use a national, uh, national flag uh, in your fights and in your celebrations, but not every day. Uh, I felt that that was expression of a, a simple patriotism, everyday patriotism, when you, when you uh, just honor your own country and you feel part of it not only when fighting, but when working or, or having your free time. And third thing was uh, we had a meeting, we, we had a reception in, I believe it, it was a Flag Day celebration, some small town, I don't remember the name. Uh, and I was surprised that I couldn't uh, distinguish who was the mayor, uh, who was the teacher, uh, who was uh, neighborhood leader, whatever, uh, everybody seemed to do some job and everybody seemed to be equal. <clears throat> uh, that, that was the first impression from, for me coming from Soviet regime where here he uh, was absolutely clear that uh, there might be communities where his people uh, voluntarily undertake what to do for the sake of, of their neighborhood or their town and of their country, uh, which is called uh, civil society. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure I understood fully what this is all about, but my feeling was that this kind of uh, social structure is the only way to uh, bring prosperity, to bring progress, and to bring democracy. <clears throat> uh, we didn't catch up Sweden uh, by economic wealth yet, but we're catching up rather fast. We can fish in the middle of Vilnius uh, for salmon because rivers are much cleaner than before, and we fully understand that the Baltic Sea is the most polluted in the world, and this is, this is our task to make it better. Uh, we are together with Sweden, members of European Union, and uh, as I understand, often we, we vote the same way. Uh, what we did not manage to catch up in Lithuania is civil society. We're doing better, much better than, than before, but still a lot of work wait, is, is waiting for us, and not only politicians, but the society itself, which we represent. And finally, about my relations to Sweden, uh, in 2008 I was appointed uh, special envoy of Prime Minister to negotiate with you uh, 
energy security because of closing of Ignalina nuclear power plant. Our mission resulted in creation by the Commission of uh, Baltic Energy Markets Interconnection Plan, uh, including a number of projects. One of the projects was uh, electric interconnection between Lithuania and guess what? Sweden, of course. So thank you, Sweden. And thank you, Lithuania. So from the, the dreams in Latvia over to fulfill some of the dreams in, in Lithuania, we now turn over to Estonia. And Esma, uh, born 46 in Tallinn, uh, studied Tallinn University, uh, and has a career in Estonian television. He has been a program deputy director, editor in chief of news program Aktualne Camera, a presenter, news reader, commentator. He has been the Baltic's correspondent, and served at the office of the president of the Republic of Estonia as a media advisor. And he has been member of the parliament in Estonia, the Riguku, since 2003, and served uh, earlier, previous, as chair of the of Foreign Affairs Committee um, and uh, is now uh, chairman of the National Defense Committee. Please, Ian, the floor is yours. Thank you, Chair. Dear colleagues, colleagues in democracy, I'd like to start uh, with a question, and the question is as follows. What has changed in 30 years in the world and in your country? I understand that uh, for Swedes this question is probably quite easy to answer. Almost everything is the same. You live in a prosperous, rich, democratic country. You have the same king. Appa was 30 years ago still popular, and Appa is again extremely popular everywhere. In countries like Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the answer is totally different, although similar. Today, I think uh, my colleagues agree we live not only in different country, but in a different planet. We remember very well the days 30 years ago, and I have memories from the Monday meetings because Anders Kung, evidently very known to you, was my close colleague when we started the first private TV station in Estonia. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, at that time, 30 years ago, I was the chief editor of Estonian national TV news and the correspondent to one of the Finnish TV channels. I'm sure that part of my material I have sent to you from dramatic and tragic events in Latvia, Lithuania and Georgia were of my camera because I went there as a representative of Estonian TV, but I work as a representative and correspondent for the Finnish TV, so they could not understand that this guy could send his material to Helsinki and from Helsinki to Stockholm to, to Oslo and, and uh, every other possible um, countries and um, cities. Then I worked uh, as an advisor to Estonian President Lennart Meri. Uh, then we activated a slogan, never again alone. This means very much for Estonia today. We started 30 years ago pretty much alone. Then we understood that we had many friends in Latvia and Lithuania 
and many friends in Finland and Sweden. We stood together, we achieved a lot. I'd say that it was a miracle. But uh, our nations have this ability to use even the smallest opportunity when Estonia gained the first time our independence, the situation was almost the same. Never ag alone again. Today we stand together. The world has changed, but has it enough? We see that uh, in many parts of our planet there are tensions, there are wars. Today I saw and heard the news from uh, Washington. They have had and agreed on a new uh, security um, concept among United States, United Kingdom and Australia. And uh, of course the main reason to be sure is uh, China. Uh, of course, we have problems uh, near our borders. I'm not talking about uh, the military exercises Zapat, West 21, very close to Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia is, is almost there, Poland. But luckily, we work together and we must keep that way. Then it's possible that after 30 years, when you are veterans and sitting here, uh, you can make the same uh, conclusion that we have had new victories, we have achieved a lot together with Latvia, Lithuania, with Sweden, with Finland and other nations uh, in the European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ian. Never alone, always together. Uh, and as a bridge to the next speaker, uh, Celia Brink, it's not uh, ABBA, well, not only ABBA, but it's the journalism. Cecilia Brink, she's the president of the Stockholm City Council. She was born in Lund, 1962, and she has a background in journalism and publishing and studied in uh, Lund. From 2006 until 2010, she served as a full-time elected representative in the city of Stockholm. She re-entered Stockholm City Council in 2014 after spending four years as a member of the Swedish Riksdag, a colleague to me, taking over the position of opposition vice mayor. Uh, up and, uh, and following the general and local election in September 2018, the city council elected Cecilia Brink as president of Stockholm City Council. She has been president of the Confederation of Swedish conservative and liberal students, that's quite important, uh, and uh, she has been extremely involved in the Monday meetings. So take us back in time, Cecilia. Thank you, Hans, and thank you all for inviting me to be a member of this wonderful panel. I'm not sure about uh, what I feel about having been placed so uh, decisively in the category past. Uh, but I'll get back to you on that at, at a later moment. Uh, I've been, I think, really, really close to history in the making two times in my life, and they were sort of connected with each other. The first time, I remember, was in the autumn of 1989, when I watched on Danish television, which was still state-owned, but a little bit less obedient than the Swedish state television at that time, I watched the live press conference from Berlin where a minor Communist Party official answered a question about when were the borders to open, and he said, uh, sofort, which means now, and that was it. 
And something in my head said that this, this is a momentous moment in world history. Nobody knew quite how important it would be. You know, now when we talk about the fall of the Berlin Wall, it's as if that was what happened. Somebody made a decision and then, then they tore down the Berlin Wall and everybody was happy. It was indeed a very dramatic process which could have gone terribly wrong at so many points, so many times. That was the first time. The second time was also in 1989. It started in 1989 in August. I don't remember the date. I think maybe 22nd or 23rd of August when I watched on television the human chain of people 2.5 million people holding hands in a line stretching for nearly, uh, I think, 700 kilometers through Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, holding hands for peace and independence and self-determination. And then 1990 came around uh, the Estonian Latvian and Lithuanian authorities decided to declare their independence. Uh, as Hans Wallmark said in his introduction, I was born in Lund, which is a city in the south of Sweden, in south of Sweden, and I moved to Stockholm in the summer of 1990. It started work at, work at Timbro. Now I'm starting to get to the point. Uh, I had two bosses at Timbro. One is sitting there, Gunnar Herkmark, and the other one was the sadly departed and very much lamented Matsi Wanson. And they were both instrumental in the Monday meetings at Normam's Toy. They had started in March 1990, and we who worked there were recruited, kind of, to help. Not forcefully in any way, but this is a very important issue. I think up till that point, I think we had sort of regarded the issue of independence for the Baltic states as something very theoretical. This is, this is a dream, this is something we wish for, but it probably won't happen in our lifetime. Then it started to become real. Uh, we were recruited to help with the meetings, uh, and many of you have heard my track story already. I'm going to repeat it anyway, in a very, brief, uh, very briefly. My task was to go to the car rental place in Södermalm. Remember, I had been living in Stockholm for about three months. Um, to get the small pickup truck we used to drive it from the rental place to Normam's toy up onto the toy, onto the square in defiance of any traffic regulation known to man, uh, to park it there and then we used it as a podium for the speakers. Because in the beginning, I think they were standing on a wooden crate or a stool that somebody brought from Timbro, but as the meetings grew, more and more people attended them. There was a need to see the speakers, not just hear them. So, hence the issue of the truck. Uh, I don't think any of us, apart I think from Gunnar and Mats and also Peter Luxup, who was one of, of the early enthusiasts, and Anders Kung has already been mentioned, really understood the importance of these meetings and the impact of these meetings, at least not in the beginning. They were a venue for us to show our solidarity, to support uh, the struggles of our neighbours on the other side of the Baltic Sea. Something that still was slightly controversial in the Swedish debate in the early 90s, even after the declarations of independence in 1990. And as the movement, the Monday movement, gained momentum, more and more people came to join us. What started out with 15, 20 people, I think at the most it was more than a thousand. The square was packed with people. And virtually anybody whose names later came to be connected with political offices in Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were there as speakers, many of them several times. Uh, it, the reality and the seriousness of the issue became very clear to, to us in January 1991 when suddenly there were images shown on television of, of tanks 
in front of the parliament buildings in Riga and Vilnius. There were images of, of special forces moving in, frightened but very determined people, as we've heard earlier, barricades being put up very, very hurriedly. And at that point, the Monday movement kind of transformed into becoming a lifeline for many politicians and activists. It was a safe place. You could speak freely, surrounded by friends who supported you and who supported your cause. I have a very, very vivid image in my mind. Uh, remember, it's 30 years ago, so I don't remember that many names, uh, of somebody, a guest invited to speak on the Monday meeting of that week, standing in Mathieu Wanson's office at Timbro, which was just a few blocks away from Norman's Torre, trying desperately to get a call through home to see that his family was okay. Uh, he did it eventually, but the, all the, during this entire situation, the images of tanks were playing on television in front of us. It was incredibly frightening. And let's not, let's not forget that people, people died in Riga, in Vilnius, in Estonia, for the cause of freedom. And let's not forget those who, who paid with their lives for their, the fight for independence. Anything could happen. There were nearly 80 Monday meetings in Stockholm, all in all, 71. And the last was in September 1991, 30 years ago. And I don't think we should forget that Stockholm wasn't the only place where the, these meetings were held. Uh, there were, at one point, more than nearly 50 Swedish cities that held Monday meetings on a regular basis. Uh, not every Monday, but may, maybe every second Monday, because this, the feeling of support and the feeling of being a part of history, uh, live, so to speak, was so strong. And there has always been a very great sense of friendship and, and solidarity between Sweden and Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. You are our neighbors, amongst our closest neighbors. A few months ago, I, I met with the Lithuanian president who visited Stockholm, and he told me that he was born in Klaipeda. And when he was a child in Klaipeda during the Soviet years, he heard stories about the Swedish island Gotland, which was actually closer to Klaipeda than Vilnius is. And Gotland was a marvelous place where people lived in freedom and prosperity. And his dream was that one day in my life, I will get there. And I will, uh, I will fight to see, to see to it so that my people in Lithuania get the same freedom, the same prosperity, and the same opportunities as people have in Gotland. Uh, for my part, I'm very proud of having been a very small and insignificant, although a small cog in this entire machinery that made that dream come true. So I'm very honored to, to be here today. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And if uh, persons such as uh, Mathieu Wansson, Gunnar Hökmark and Cecilia Brink was instrumental to have this kind of Monday meetings to show the support, I would say that the next speaker, uh, Ambassador Lars Fridén, have been really instrumental to re-establish the context, the diplomatic relations between Sweden uh, and with the Baltic Republics, especially Latvia. And you are uh, also a, a beacon in, in Swedish diplomacy. <coughs> Lars Fridén uh, has been the ambassador, served as an ambassador to China, People's Republic of China and Mongolia. 2010 to 2016. Uh, he had been in Swedish Foreign Service since 1982. He had a background in Chinese and Russian, and his career has centered around uh, China and the Soviet Union slash Russia. In 1990, he became the first diplomat from any country to be stationed in Latvia since 1940. Please, Lars Fredén. Thank you, Hans. <clears throat> I begin with a sound check. Can you hear me? Speaking too loud or too soft? No? No? I take it as a no. <laughs> I feel very emotional. I felt very emotional when I walked from my flat in the old town in this direction and saw all of the flags, the four flags together. I really don't know what to, where to begin. I could talk about my life in, in the field, my extreme loneliness in the field, 
There were two reasons for this. One was that I decided to trust no one. Delta has explained why this was a wise decision. The second was that I never received any instructions on what to do or what to say or what to even to report. Because the fact is that the Swedish Foreign Ministry was quite uncertain on how to handle this situation. I nowadays regard the lack of restrictions as a, not just a blessing, blessing in disguise, but a very great blessing in itself, because I'm sure if I had received instructions, they will, would have been detrimental at least to the image of Sweden. I could talk about what happened after the fall of the collapse of the Soviet Union and the restored independence, both the Jure and de facto, of all three Baltic countries. Those two historic events happened to occur simultaneously with a change in the Swedish government. In fact, there was only a, a month's difference. And the new government adopted a very different tone than the previous one. Baltic affairs became a priority not just for its foreign policy, but for its entire policy. And I am proud to have been a part of that. The task we set ourselves was to do everything we could to ensure that all interested parties regarded the restored independence of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania as a permanent fact, that it would endure, that it would endure. There were those who thought that they, you, you would not endure, or that you would endure in a not a very successful manner. You would not be able to change your economy's uh, extreme dependence on the rest of the Soviet Union. You would not be able to, um, to develop a democracy. You would not be able, I speak now about Estonia and Lithuania, uh, Latvia, to uh, integrate the uh, very large Russophone uh, um, populations in your countries. You would not be able to build up a serious defense. You would not even be able to um, make sure that the Russian, Russian troops left Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania. A large part of the cognoscenti of security policy believed this would not happen. The best solution would be if the um, ground forces left but Skrunda, the uh, strategic radar station in Latvia, would remain. Paldiski, the uh, submarine, nuclear submarine simulators in Estonia, would remain, of course. And uh, also all the robot installations along the coasts of um, the entire Baltic coast, including the islands, would also remain. What was our audience? Well, our audience was Washington. Brussels, Paris, London, Berlin, but of course, mainly Moscow. We weren't sure that it would work, but we certainly felt that it was our very duty to, to try. And our work centered on two things. One was, as I said, the true pullout agreements, and myself and Oyars Kalnins ended up at a memorable occasion in 1994 in the basement of the Washington, I mean, the White House Situation Room in the basement, this one that still exists in an effort, successful as it turned out, to interest the United States in the continued security of Latvia. In that process, Sweden had a closer cooperation on an important security issue than we have ever had before and since. And the other issue was citizenship legislation. I could speak about that, but I won't. I'd li instead, I will like to issue, bring forth, four very deeply felt thank yous. First to Gunnar Höckmark, and I speak now, in general I speak as a retiree, of course, I'm not just a, a Swedish citizen. The Monday meetings restored this Swede's sense of self-respect. Thank you very much. My second thank you is to the representatives of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, who are here in this hall today. And that is to, to thank you for conducting your freedom struggle entirely with peaceful means. This is not always the case, as we know, with, with independent struggles. And as you know, and or as, as I believe, your situation today, our policy then, would have been entirely different if there had been violence from your side. There was no violence from your side, the only violence that there was came from the other side. This also includes, this thank you goes also for after 1991. 
History shows us very few examples of people slipping out, as it were, from dictatorship without exercising severe retribution of the instruments of that dictatorship. And in Riga, of course, for a very long time, in Tallinn for a very long time, in Vilnius for a very long time, people who used to be in the KGB, the GRU, who had even manned the cellars, the torture cellars that exist in all these three countries, walking around, nothing happened to them. This is extremely remarkable. And I give thanks to you for that too. Third, my profound admiration and thanks to every representative of Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania here today for the hardships, privations that you went through to achieve not just independence, but also to become successful, democratic, responsible European states with well-functioning economies. Your people suffered an awful lot and the political establishments in your countries had to hold the line somehow. This was also not self-evident that it would happen. And finally, I'd like to thank all Lithuanians, Latvians and Estonians whom I have had the privilege of knowing for the most profound and useful education I as an individual have ever received anywhere. And I have gone to many universities in my life. In the parliament in Vilnius, the parliament in Riga, in discussions with Lennart Meri, Yuri Luik, I received an education in politics, in foreign relations, in national security policy, but above all, in morality, about dignity and courage. I've written books about this and I formulated what I call the tragic dimension. A serious country has a tragic dimension. It realizes that history is not a given, that independence is not a given, that it has to be fought for. And that is what you provided to me. It seldom exists in this country, my country. We are basically an ahistoric country. We are a non-threatened country. You are all three countries that have been threatened and are still being threatened. So I'd like to thank you for your patience in explaining to us about the basics of dignity and courage. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador Fridén. I think it was a fantastic ending of this first panel. Uh, we really hear the voice ringing in our ears. With that, I say thank you to the first panel. We are now going to switch to have the second panel. Uh, so I invite uh, the uh, Madam Speaker, Madam Speaker, Mr. Speaker, and Gunnar. Um, yeah. And when we also switch signs, I start. We are a little, uh, we have lost a little time, but uh, it has been extremely interesting. Uh, past and present, and uh, really as a bridge between everything, uh, um, both between past and present, but also between the Monday meetings and current politics, we have Gunnar Hökmark. Uh, Born 1952 in Ystad in uh, Skåne, study at University of Lund, still in Skåne. He has been member of the Swedish Parliament between 82 and 2004, and as a member of the Swedish Parliament, he served in the Committee on Finance, and he was a spokesperson on economic affairs for uh, the Moderate Party. He has been chairman of the Committee on the Constitution, and between uh, 2004 and 
2019, he was member of the European Parliament and head of the Swedish EPP delegation, and also for many years vice president of the EPP group inside the European Parliament. Um, he uh, has been really instrumental in the enlargement process and in the cooperation with the Eastern Partnership. Uh, Gunnar Hökmark is today, among other things, chairman of the foreign policy think tank Stockholm Free World Forum and also one of the co-founders together with Andres Küng and, and Håkan Holmberg and Peter Lukseb of the Monday meetings. So please, Gunnar, the floor is yours. But, Herr Talman, I think I should say it one more time. It was a long time ago. Speakers of the free and sovereign nations of Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, and Your Excellencies, um, it's fantastic to take part of this event. When I walked here as Lars Fredin also touched upon. I saw the Estonian flag, the Latvian flag, Lithuanian, Lithuanian flag, and the Swedish flag, all flying with the winds of freedom. That's quite fantastic, because that was not how things were. A little bit more than 30 years. At that time, it would have been a political provocation. Now it's a regular normality. And normality is one of the best things you can have in the world. A good friend of mine, Tune Kelam, some of you know him, uh, some of you will know a little bit more about him after this. He told me the first time when I visited Estonia, so it must have been either 88 or 89. He told me, Gunnar, I long for the day when Estonia is just as dull country as Sweden. <laughs> he didn't mean dull. He, mean, he did mean dull in the stable meaning, normality. The dullness of not being afraid. The dullness of having the opportunity to sit and talk and chat as we are doing now. That's how dull you are all now. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Freedom. <laughs> and, you know, it's even better than that because our region is today one of the most integrated regions of European Union. Our economies and this is important in a time when we talk about crisis. Our economies belong to the most competitive clusters in the world. In a time when we're discussing economic crisis in some parts of Europe, this is a stronghold. Not only for economy, but because of that also for the voices we would like to make clear. And I think our challenge now is, of course, Hans touched upon it, life is about the past, the present, and the future. We can bring the knowledge from the past, not look back too much, but bring the knowledge from the past into the present and form the future. And one thing that I learned myself from the, dealing with the Monday movement, which was a fantastic thing, because we sat, I, I, I met some friends on a Thursday evening, and the day after I phoned Peter, I phoned uh, Andres King, and I phoned uh, Håkan Holmberg, and then on the Monday, the day after, we started, and we had 300 people coming at the same time. And then the next time, we were 2,000 people and uh, the foreign minister of Sweden. I'm not going to dive into political diversions now, but uh, he had not exactly the same meaning as we had. But after that, Swedish foreign policy started to move and change. Uh, and in the end, Sweden was a country supporting 
Baltic independence all over the country. And that is a learning I think we need to have in this time. Belarus, Russia, China. Who could have believed that the mighty Soviet Union just would collapse? A lot of people didn't. A lot of people told me, let's be realist. Well, I would say that the only way to be realist is to understand that reality changes. And it's a matter of what direction should reality change? Either or with the flags flying with the wind for freedom. And when I think about Belarus and China and Russia, I think it's so important that our countries becomes a nucleus in the long term standing up for freedom and democracy. The Nordic countries, the Baltic countries are some of the world's most stable democracies today. And we can do a lot influencing others. We can do a lot to secure that European Union is strong. We need to support Lithuania, who is just now in the front for a lot of conflicts. Belarus and uh, the Navalny opposition is there uh, and uh, some uh, discussions with China to put it mildly. I mean there is an American saying we need to hang together because otherwise we will all hang together. And this is true now as well because what happened the last years is that the despotism and the dictatorship has won some sort of terrain, not only in territorial meaning, but also in the intellectual and mental meaning. And we need to stand up for that. And what I learned from the Monday movement was, first of all, to meet all of those courageous people at the other side of the Baltic Sea. And, you know, they all had one thing in common. They were not bombastic. They were calm. They were philosophical. They were deeply rooted in their ideas and their beliefs. And I think we need to be deeply rooted in our ideas and beliefs. And we need to stand up together and not say we shall do it tomorrow. We shall start doing it today. Because you know one thing is that democracy, we saw it at that time, and we will see it now, is in the long term perspective always stronger than the dictatorship's brutal force. Because why? Because they need brutal force. We need the support of people. And my learning from the Monday movement, from the courageous liberation of the Baltic countries, and from the enormous contribution you gave in Europe, Lars Fredin mentioned it as well, the peaceful transformation that made it possible to unify Europe. You gave it to us. And this is not fully recognized, but that's an important brickstone in the building of Europe. And now we have some bricks to stand upon and let's proceed. Let's learn from the past. Don't look back. Look for the future. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Gunnar. Um, with the rhetoric from the Monday meeting 30 years ago, but with the content of the future. And it's also fantastic to he hear these three cheers for dullness. And I'm happy to say, if you look in the mirror, you're also part of this dullness, uh, because you are part of the, the freedom and independence. Thank you, Gunnar. I now turn to the uh, speaker of um, Latvia, Inara Murniesha. Inara was born in 1970. Uh, she uh, had graduated from the University of Latvia before she becoming a politician. Uh, she was for 16 years worked as a journalist in the largest daily newspaper, Latvia's Avise, uh, and mainly covering domestic and foreign political uh, affairs. From 2011 until 2014, she was chairperson of the Human Rights and Public Affairs Committee in SEMA. And since 2014, she has uh, been serving as the speaker of the SEMA in uh, Riga. So please, Inar. 
Thank you, Honorable Speaker Nolan, my Baltic colleagues, fellow, uh, by my fellow colleagues, freedom fighters from Baltic states, uh, organizers of Monday meetings from Sweden, I am extremely honored to be today here in Sweden with you to celebrate democracy, to celebrate uh, friendship. Well, this seminar was divided in two parts. The first part passed, the second part of today, but uh, to my mind it's very difficult to divide it in two parts because what was uh, 30 years ago in a long-term perspective, I can't call it past because they are quite fresh memories uh, for me today. And I have decided to share my memories of the 4th of May. Uh, well, Madame Brink, you mentioned uh, Monday meetings, uh, which started uh, in March 1990. Just Two years after you started here in Sweden, in Latvia, in our parliament voted for freedom. And, uh, well, it was so glorious moment in, in my country. Uh, there has been much said on this spectacular day in our parliament, but uh, in my apartment. I've spent uh, this day together with my family. I was 19, 18 uh, year old. Well, and we celebrated this day together with my family, uh, with my grandmother. She's been deported to Siberia during the Soviet occupation twice and twice uh, she went to Siberia with her three children, very small children. Then she came back for the first deportation and some years ago, uh, and after some years she was deported twice. Well, she returned and she returned with all three children. And it was, um, it, it was, um, glorious moment for her. She cried and uh, those were tears of joy because she said I was uh, just in Siberia, it was just my dream for Latvia, dream for freedom, dream for Latvian language, dream for my culture, dream for Latvian black bread. And no, just in one day, it comes true. Uh, well, and she said, don't worry, I'm crying, but it's tears of joy. But now back to dull matters, yes, <laughs> to the future. Uh, well, and uh, I'd like to say that uh, what we can learn from the history of regaining the independence of the Baltic states is that freedom and independence are in our own hands. And today it's up to us to protect it. Democratic values are at the heart of our societies and in our cooperation, and we must stand up for them. Uh, what we must do is to strengthen parliamentary democracy and ensure parliamentary scrutiny over government decisions. It, it's what we parliamentarians are doing in our parliaments. But we live in special times. Dur uh, du during COVID-19 pandemic, we face growing public skepticism about parliamentary democracy, about democracy itself. Uh, we face fragmentation of society, mounting public fatigue from social restrictions introduced, introduced during COVID-19 pandemic. 
Well, but uh, our strength lies in effective multilateral cooperation and in rules-based international order. 30 years after regaining independence, the Baltic states are closely integrated in international structures. The Nordic-Baltic cooperation is our first point of reference. And today we, Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia and Sweden are like-minded EU members. And last week in the World Conference of Speakers of Parliament, we speakers discussed how to strike a balance between Parliament's openness, transparency and security. We had valuable discussion on global governance. Currently, Estonia is successfully representing the interests of Nordic and Baltic region in the, uh, in the United Nations Security Council. It brings, it brings international attention to such issues as uh, of our common concern as Belarus and the security situation in Ukraine. In the future, we should work together to ensure continuous presence of the Nordic Baltic countries in the United Nations Security Council. It, it, it is very important. It is very important. And likewise, Sweden, as the chair of OECE, can count on our support for protection of human rights, democracy, the rule of law in the OECE region, especially in view of Russia's continued aggression against Ukraine and and going developments in Belarus. Our priority is to strengthen security in our region. We, Baltic countries and Sweden, are interdependent. Our security is your security. Russia's aggressive military posture along our borders and towards Ukraine, Russia's growing military influence in Belarus are clear examples of the security challenges we face. We follow closely the strategic exercise Zapad that is taking place in Russia and Belarus. And the political situation in Belarus adds additional complexity to these maneuvers. It is our collective responsibility to ensure security and stability in the region and in Europe as a whole. We consider that NATO collective steps in the region, including the enhanced forward presence in the Baltic States and Poland, play important role in deterring Russia's actions. And we are doing our part in the collective efforts of NATO. This year, Latvia invests 2.3% of GDP in defense, which contributes to develop, the development of our capabilities. Uh, we see Sweden and Finland as the closest partners of NATO, and we appreciate Sweden's steps to continue strengthening the national defense. In August, we, three Baltic speakers and uh, President of European Parliament, Mr. Sassoli, we visited Lithuanian state border uh, with Belarus. Uh, what we see is that Belarus is continuing with its hybrid attack. And it is unacceptable that Belarus, uh, Belarusian authorities are forcing people to illegally cross the border into the territories of the neighboring countries and are depriving them of, of opportunity to return to the countries of origin. The situation on the Latvia-Belarus border is similar. We are trying to provide a balanced solution to this difficult situation, taking into account both national security and humanitarian considerations. Within the EU, we need to use this momentum to rethink our approach towards the protection of the EU borders, and we should continue to demand that Belarus stop violence, release political prisoners, and 
organize free and fair presidential elections as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And from uh, Latvia, we go to Estonia, and we have the speaker Yuri Ratas, born 1978 in Tallinn, uh, educated, studied in Tallinn Technical University and University of Tartu, uh, and have a career in Tallinn City Office as an economic advisor, as an assistant mayor of Tallinn, and then mayor 2005 to 2007, and prime minister of Republic of Estonia 2016 to 2021. And uh, Yuri Ratas has also been chairman of the board of Estonian Basketball Association uh, and have been a member of Riguku since uh, 2007 and served as vice president and he's now the speaker. Please, Yuri Ratas, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, honorable colleagues. Dear speaker from Sweden, thank you for this invitation and really great, great event here today and during the next days. My really good colleagues from Lithuania and Latvia, fellow Estonians, excellences, ambassadors. I would like to say when I was listening to this first part, four great speeches, how all of you describe your personal way and memories during 30 years ago. Gunnar, actually, I think we met. I think actually we met more than 30 years ago. I remember that my, my father was one of the leader Estonian Green movement. It, it wasn't this time political movement. Uh, and then I, I remember that we, we visited actually Sweden and, and Stockholm and, and one of my memories that we were in some kind of park and, and there were the speeches and of course I was then 10 or 11 years ago, 11 years old and, and maybe it was a little bit hard to understand but uh, I think these, these steps or these situations or moment, uh, momentums, they were this kind of first, how to say, thesis for me of the democracy and uh, what it means to, to see publicly uh, the flag, blue, black and white. It was, of course, for these young, young boys, very, very important and emotional momentums. I also would like to say that um, we are celebrating this year our 100th anniversary and of diplomatic relations uh, which started 5th of February 1921 and, and then uh, we are also celebrating our 30th anniversary of our re-establishing of our diplomatic relations with you, dear friends here from Sweden. But um, I also remember my, my personal memories, uh, the years, or let's say in the end of 80s, when, uh, and, and during the 80s when my, my father described that I, I have also the aunt here in, in Sweden, in Kattenburg, and then of course then I think I asked that why she is in, in, in Sweden and we are here in Estonia. And, and of course, uh, Father then explained me what happened during the 40s, and and I'm I really appreciate. And I would like to say also today that I think it was really strong support from your side, all three Baltic countries. And and actually, my my aunt escaped uh, from Gleipeda. I I, re I read the story, and it was really small fish, this kind of boat, and. They are trying several times, and, uh, and it, it, it is really an interesting story. And, uh, and then uh, I remember, I think it was 87, when uh, we, we, I, I was uh, then in, in, 
in port of Tallinn, and uh, we are we, we were waiting my father's uh, sister, and then I saw saw her first time, and and uh, 1988, then we had the opportunity to to visit Katzenberg and also the Lisenberg Park, and of, it was something very very special. But if we are talking today, then what uh, my good colleague Inara said that now we could we, we must see today's world and also the future and protect uh, the democracy and rule of law and. And it is something very special that we could say that one of our our countries today and and um, someone is maybe tomorrow the member of the United Nations Security Council and, and it is something very 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 special and I am really proud of that and I am really thankful for you your commitment your contribution support during these these let's say last 30 years and um, if I take our 30 year old generation has grown up having this kind of, of no personal memory of Soviet regime and uh, if I am talking today life then next uh, next month in the middle of October our young people who have been born in the EU member state Estonia are going to use their right to vote in our local elections. Uh, and the life speeds fast forward and we think less and less of the past, like you, Kunnar, also told. And the events like today's seminar help us to reconnect these important landmarks of our, uh, our history. Our restored independence was not recognized at once, achieving it took both Persians' action and talks. Among other things, we had to convince the international community that our claim of statehood is justified. Fortunately, we were not left alone in this struggle. The importance of physical presence of supportive friends and allies becomes even more clear in times of uncertainty, in those times when we need to know that we are not facing the hardest challenges alone. The Kingdom of Sweden re-recognized, like I said, the Republic of Estonia 27 of August 1991, and was the very first country to appoint its ambassador to Estonia. Swedish ambassador Lars Arne Grundberg started his assignment in Tallinn only nine days after the restoration of independence. I just would like to say that today and tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, of course, it is also our celebration last 30 years of re-established diplomatic ties and friendly and very close and I would like to say the same values, relations between Baltic countries and Sweden. Thank you, Yuri, and thank you for mentioning uh, our uh, embassy in, uh, in Tallinn, and we are very proud to have our embassy is so central in all your three capitals, in, in Tallinn, in Riga and in, in Vilnius. Now I give the floor to uh, the speaker of um, Lithuania, Victoria Cimilite Nielsen. Uh, born in 83, uh, and in my paper it says that you are graduated from the University of Latvia. Oh, it's correct. <laughs> uh, and uh, you are a professional chess player. You have a chess grandmaster, a long-time member of the national chess team of Lithuania. And 2000-2004, you were the winner of the World Chess Olympiads. And uh, you started your political career in the uh, parliament, in the same as uh, in, in Lithuania 2016, and was elected a speaker in November last year. So please, Victoria. Thank you. Dear honorable colleagues, speakers, your excellencies, ambassadors, 
members of parliaments, participants of Monday movements, movement. It is indeed a great pleasure to address you today here on the occasion of the 30 years anniversary, you could argue, of the Monday meetings for the independence of the Baltic states. It gives us an opportunity to look back to the 30 years and to reflect upon the both past and the future and our cooperation. Just a week ago, in the Seimos of Lithuania, an event took place organized by the Embassy of Sweden, and I would like to thank Madam Ambassador for that once again, to mark Monday movement. It was attended by Mr. Gunnar Hockmark, by Mr. Lashfreden, who shared their memories um, of those times when freedom and independence uh, was still uh, just a dream that Estonia, Latvia and Lithuania were aspiring to. Uh, the dream that Swedish people so strongly supported in a very uncertain and especially important time between March 19, 1990 and uh, September 16, 1991. This dream did come true. We restored independence. But later, one could argue, an almost equally difficult task awaited us. A challenge of building a state that is firmly rooted in the values of democracy, rule of law, respect for human rights, a challenge of becoming a full-fledged member of the European family of countries. And during that building period, Sweden has been an important partner, a crucial ally. In the beginning of the 90s, providing our young politicians, our civil servants, uh, members of NGOs with, with what um, Mr. Herkmark uh, called crash courses in, uh, on themes ranging from market economy to human rights, later in supporting our aspirations to join the European Union. The fight for democracy and freedom is not a finite process. Every generation has to defend it, every generation has to do it in its own way and on its own terms. I would also add that preserving and nurturing respect for human rights is always a work in progress. And in that important work, Sweden is our partner, sharing experience, working together with our NGOs, organizing events, supporting initiatives aimed at achieving gender equality, eliminating domestic violence, ensuring the rights of minorities. We have come a long way during those 30 years in those areas, but it is still a work in progress especially considering that human rights are under pressure today globally due to COVID pandemic, due to social fragmentation, climate change, that ultimately leads to conflicts and deprivation. Therefore, we must continue our common efforts since respect for human rights is the most important building block that our societies rest upon. Today, we enjoy cooperation on a wide range of fields that offer us opportunities of growth. <clears throat> but we also face common threats, threats to our security, threats to the environment that we stand little or no chance against should we choose to face them alone. The efforts to mitigate climate change are taking a firm place in Lithuania's political agenda. Greening the economy, working together on innovative clean solutions is a way forward and in that we have a duty to our young generation and to the generations who are to come. As we look back to the past 30 years with a sense of achievement and gratitude, we also witness that the dramatic fight for democracy and freedom happens literally as we speak, very close to our borders. In the neighboring Belarus, the cold-blooded Lukashenko regime does not shy away from persecuting Belarusian people and directing flows of illegal migrants as a means of putting pressure on the whole of the European Union. Just like 30 years ago, Sweden supported the Baltic countries. We see it our duty, as our duty, and um, well, if you wish, as a kind of debt, um, to support Belarusian people in their fight for freedom and human dignity. Today we feel that we have some experience in building a democracy and nurturing civil society that we can share with our neighbors in Belarus, while at the same time continuing to count on your support in this never-ending process. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Uh, the time is now uh, half past two, so I invite uh, Mr. Speaker, Dr. Norlen, to wrap up this family gathering, and this Nordic Baltic family gathering. So, in all those happy spirits that have been delivered, please, Mr. Speaker. I think this has been a fantastic seminar. Uh, these last 90 minutes have been truly both moving and, uh, and uh, I think we have been both, both moved and learned a lot. Uh, we have listened to so many different aspects of the liberation of Latvia, Lithuania and Estonia. Uh, I've been given new insights and uh, I think being part of this seminar has made me not only wiser but also proud, proud of the achievements of the Baltic people, proud of the achievements of those who fought for their independence through the Monday movement here in Stockholm and otherwise, other, uh, elsewhere in Sweden, uh, because I think they, they show so much of solidarity, solidarity between the Baltic peoples, but also solidarity between the Swedish and the Baltic peoples. Um, so um, I leave this, this great chamber with uh, a light heart, uh, very uh, invigorated by all, all your testimonies and all your, your shared stories. Uh, in the last 30 years you have come an impressively long way. How the next 30 years will shape our region, nobody can know. It is, as it's sometimes said, hard to make predictions, especially about the future. Uh, but one thing is certain, and that is that the ties between our countries are stronger than ever, and they will last for many, many years to come. Thank you for attending this seminar. Thank, thank you for contributing. And now it's time for a more practical exercise. We're going to walk down memory lane to Norman's Tory, just a few blocks from here. That is where the Monday movement once began, and we're going to take part in a reconstruction of one of these Monday meetings. Thank you again, and see you there in a short while.